thing in India, e-commerce is still so new that maybe the largest businesses would be doing 10, 15,000 yeah. orders a day. And we land up in China and we visit one of the companies. They were doing two and a half lakh orders that particular day when we were standing in the warehouse. And that just blew our mind away. I believe Ola, Urban Company and Mamarth are top three of your investments. So if you can recall the stories behind how you met, what is the spark that you saw in these entrepreneurs? We actually prefer investing in businesses where the market may seem extremely small right now yeah but what they are doing is an absolute quote unquote 10x experience the only thing that matters eventually for any business who's your customer what do they want from you and can you give it to them better and most more cost yeah. efficiently than anyone else yeah. That is by definition the business. The GDP of India is regularly growing. People's disposable incomes are growing. And as a result, every year, a very large number of families in India cross the orbit of having met their basic needs and have some money to spare. That incremental small yeah. amount of money to spare creates new businesses because now they have the money. They aspire for better things. In first year of college, they ran a poll of what students want to do when they graduate from IIT Delhi. Of all the career options, the number one was becoming an entrepreneur. Hi, this is Siddharth Aluwalia. Welcome to The Neon Show. Today, I have a very special guest, a person who is responsible with his co-founders of building the guardrails of Indian e-commerce. Rohit Pansal, co-founder of Snapdeal and of Titan Capital, one of the most recognized seed stage firms in India, investing into startups. Rohit, so proud to have you on the Neon Show. I am looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the podcast, uh, Siddharth. Uh, it's really my pleasure. So, what, 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 before we go dive into the, the journey of Snapdeal, of Titan, and of the, the large landscape of Indian e-commerce, the insights into Indian consumers, would, would love to tap into your memories of your childhood. Hmm. Right, you grew up in a small town near Bhatinda, which is in itself is a very small town. <laughs> yeah, no I think most people know Bhatinda post Jabbi Met. Yes, uh, outside of Jabbi Met, before that, most people didn't know even Bhatinda. Yeah, and and uh, your town has a shorter name like Malot. That's hmm. why people can recall it. Yeah, uh, right. But you, you mentioned to me it has a population of less than hundred thousand, correct? Less than one lakh, correct? Uh, people so what are your memories that shaped you today hmm. from that place so it's uh, it's it's good to go down the do, go down the memory lane sometimes so as as I, as you rightly mentioned i grew up in malot which is uh, before google maps it was very hard to find that place also now thanks to technology if someone asks me where is malot i am able to show them on google maps ki uh, but you know i grew up in a business family as in small towns there is not much of a corporate sector, right? So most people are small business people. So similarly, my dad, uh, you know, used to run a fertilizer fertilizer store. And that's the sort of family setup I grew up in. And everyone in the extended family was similar. Someone will have a clothes shop. Someone will have some other shop, etc., etc. And uh, the school I went to was, while was an English medium school. But... All the kids were from similar backgrounds. Half of them were farmer kids. Half of them were sort of doing some sort of agri-based agri business. In that environment, you know, the thing that was considered very normal thing to do uh, for most of the people, and which is how all my classmates and sort of friends were also from school, is to continue doing what their parents are doing. Because that was the safest thing to do. This is, again more than two decades back and people didn't know what opportunities exist this was before internet existed and that was the standard thing that if you are studying in school you eventually finish your education or whatever you have to do eventually you will basically go and sit in your father's store or continue if your father is a doctor you will become a doctor etc yeah. etc et thanks to my parents i felt feel they were extremely progressive in their mindset uh, and from very early age uh, they told me that this store is the absolute last backup option. You should assume it doesn't exist for you. So you figure out what you want to do and we'll help you, help you in doing that. The only thing that people knew about future education in our town was that, uh, I, by the way, I hadn't even heard of IIT back then, yeah. which is where I eventually ended up being. Uh, the only thing that people knew about for future education was that Jiske number hai, that person shows up in DPS Arkipuram. Somehow or the other, DPS Arkipuram as a brand name had become popular in our and town. 
and from your town many folks had gone before you to dps rk puram maybe 3 4 uh, I, i mean at best the person who would be the topper of class 10th in our school in one out of 2 3 years that person will have enough marks that they can probably get admitted into dps rk puram but that was all that people knew about the future of education uh, i was fortunate enough to get decent marks in class 10 and that's how i showed up showed up at dps rk puram it is after coming here that i realized what is iit uh then i realized that okay if to go to an iit most people go to a coaching class yeah. then i asked around in dps found a coaching class which you are supposed to go to try to get admitted into one vidya mandir right vidya mandir which is one of the most toughest coaching classes yeah, to so get I, into yeah so i didn't know that right <laughs> so i i had never heard of a coaching class i came to delhi i remember it was the second day in the hostel and everyone seemed to be filling some some sort of form and i was like you know what form are we all filling and he said vidya mandir ka form hai so i said what is that <laughs> they said wo coaching class hai maine kaha acha it ki coaching lene ke liye bhi exam dena padta hai they said yes it's very hard to get into so and then i thought chalo main bhi bhar deta hu and uh, that's how I, you know eventually got admitted into vidya mandir classes uh i think that's how that's how the journey journey began honestly uh, and you know i feel in some ways fortunate also that i landed up in dps rk puram because that just opened my perspective quite a bit more because uh, you know the focus on future education at least back in that those in our days on in our town where i grew up was very very limited and you moved out of your town to dps rk puram in 1999 1999 very early so it's like almost 25 years 24 25 years back correct we started one year after college me and kunal and uh, you know both me and kunal had been discussing for some time finally kunal's visa got rejected so he called me and said look i am coming back anyways we've been discussing this but it was still very tentative and once i get this call from kunal that look i am anyways coming back now so my visa is rejected so i am going to be back in india uh, ironically i had also gotten a job in the us and my visa had gotten approved but when kunal called me and said i am also coming you know we've been talking about doing this should we do it now and uh, finally when it came the time came to take the final decision that okay both of us have discussed it enough we've decided let's send that resignation email and get started on our business at that that point of time there has to be one strong reason which pushes you over the edge and makes you send that email and make that sort of jump or commitment for us that was very clear i still even though it's been many years i still very vividly remember uh, i think in those days i read somewhere that between between security and opportunity always choose opportunity and to us that was very important both of us had this candid discussion that look given the kind of education we've been through etc uh, we had enough confidence in our ability that god forbid everything we do yeah. fails and keeps failing for many many years even then uh, we have enough skills and enough confidence that we will not die homeless and hungry we will be able to at least earn enough to put food on the table if that is protected then at the age of 70 and secondly we really wanted to be entrepreneurs we really wanted to give it a shot we didn't know whether we'll succeed or fail but we really at least wanted to give it a shot at the age of 70 we didn't want to carry the regret that or oh, we really wanted to do something and yet we didn't and that i think that just uh, uh, feeling of not ha- carrying these regrets and trying to be the best version of ourselves or having the most contribution that we feel we can have is what finally made us take the plunge by the time do you remember the date you put your resignation or i remember we started September 2007 uh so must have been a month or two month or two before that is my sense and you joined iit in 2001 i joined iit in 2001 uh i came to delhi in 99 to yeah. dps where i went to 11th and 12th which is also yeah. where me and kunal met yeah. by the way we were we were classmates in in the same section in dps and then two years at uh, dps then i went to iit in 2001 i was in this five year program uh, sort of dual degree so uh which i completed by 
2006 to 7 and Kunal graduated at the same time from uh, UPenn and Wharton. Uh, 2006 to 7, both of us respectively worked. He at Microsoft, I at Capital One, uh, which is the US card company. And then in 2007 is when we quit and started our business. I think I can give two anecdotes and hmm. then I would like to jump in certain parts of how you build the e-commerce railroads sure, for sure. India. That if you see, right, one of the poorest and the most educated or aspirant region has been Bihar hmm. from India. Hmm. So earlier, the aspiration of every parent for the kids in Bihar was go to a IIT or go to a higher education, then aim for UPSC. Hmm. Now, parents are completely okay in that region hmm. of Bihar, right? And even the hinterlands of Patna is a main city, but larger hmm. suburbs, villages. That a kid from IIT, which I have seen, uh, where the parent might be farmers, going for entrepreneurship. Hmm. And and this, this is a very large change that Indian society is seeing, right? Because that region used to represent what, what actually a large of India aspires to. Yeah. Earlier it was going for civil services exam, hmm. UPSC exam. Hmm. And now slowly and steadily, entrepreneurship is becoming okay. Yeah. No, and absolutely. And look, I, I mean, there are so many examples of that which I've seen. You know, I mean, we's, uh, one of the beauties of being an investor is that you get to meet extremely smart on, and very, well, very driven entrepreneurs who come by definition from all different walks of life, right? different regions, different education backgrounds, all of them having very strong aspirations. And I think you get to hear all these stories on a on a regular basis. Like you know, I, in my own family, I've seen uh, my my nephew. He you know studied really well, got into a good engineering college, you know, became an engineer, but then later realized that his passion lies in being a chef. So then he, after his engineering degree, went and became a trained chef and opened a restaurant of his own. Which and in a tier two city in India, not even in like a Delhi, Bombay, etc. I can't imagine that having happened 20, 30 years yeah. back because you know just the instinctive reaction of the society and the parents would probably be, oh, you study to be an engineer, ye restaurant kon khulta hai. Uh, aap engineer ho to you you sort of follow the skills that you've learned. But that is changing. That is changing very fast, and that's a very good thing. That's how the country will go forward. And coming to you know you since you talked about investment, right? If you have to recall, like, I believe Ola, Urban Company and Mamarth are top, some of the top three of your investments, right? Yours and Kunal's. So, so if you can recall the stories behind how you met these and what is the spark that you saw in these entrepreneurs? It's very interesting. I, I think our first investment was probably Ola, uh, one of the earliest. Yeah. This is back in 2011 or so. Uh, I think it's very interestingly, Kunal was speaking at a panel and, you know, he comes off the panel and one of these uh, young people who's bhavish <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> met, met Kunal, at, Kunal there and said, hey, I've started this interesting business in the ride hailing space because um, I feel the experience of finding a cab, booking a cab is broken in mm -hmm. India and I want to change that. And they had like a 10 minute conversation post which they set up a phone call. Again, this is not, this is not the time when you used to have video calls. Yeah. So you used to have phone calls. As a Kunal and Bhavish had a call, uh, Kunal was absolutely sort of uh, awestruck by the level of clarity at such a young age and the sort of level of ambition he had. And then he comes in and we were not even regularly investing yeah. back then, right? This was just sort of something that we were open-minded about, but we hadn't really done anything. Then he comes and tells me, I met this really smart, smart person. Why don't you mm -hmm. meet them to meet him too? And then I spoke to, spoke to Bhavish on the phone as well. And in a one-hour call, I was also like, you know, this this person is going to do something, and that's how we ended up ended up investing in Ola, which eventually I think yeah. Bhavish is obviously done exceptionally well for everyone. And and how about Mamarth? And Mamarth was a very interesting story. So I remember, uh, I mean, both both myself and Kunal, uh, both of us have young kids, and uh, this back in the day, Kunal's wife Yashna. Uh, they just had a yeah. they just had a kid at that time and then she was looking for a good quality mosquito repellent which is slightly more natural uh, for their yeah. kids and then she started asking some people like mothers do right there's there there are these mom groups etc so she asked a few people and very interestingly on that forum more than half the forum 
came back with this unheard of unknown company suggestion that mama earth is a very good mosquito repellent she bought it and then one fine day kunal sees that at home that you know, what is this new bottle you know kuch interesting sa lag raha then he comes and shows me i also yeah. thought it's interesting uh, so then we we said okay this seems they seem to be onto something if in a small mother group i mean just a mother choosing something for their child is i feel the highest level of trust that you need to earn and if even in a small group such a large percentage of mothers are choosing then they must be doing something right uh, so we actually called up their customer care because we didn't know yeah. who the founders were so we just called up their customer care and introduced ourselves and said we want to meet uh, interestingly enough uh, like is the case with most young companies varun himself picked okay. up the phone on the <laughs> side uh, uh, because i remember yeah. back in our day also we used to yeah. answer all the customer care calls so he picked up the phone then we met varun uh, and just you know in one hour meeting again we just felt that this person is going to do something obviously what they had created already it was still a very small business they were doing like 7 lakhs a month in sales that's it so uh, but we found it very very interesting and very impressive we were absolutely stunned by our meeting with varun and pretty much he had not even left the office uh, and we pretty much had to call him back to invest okay. in the company that's how we invested in mama this is 2016 yeah and then we stayed invested uh, we still are investors in mm-hmm. the company and what about urban company urban company was a very interesting story so one of our uh, one of our classmates uh, so one, in dps yeah he later went to iit kanpur and then he was working with bcg in new york and he emails me out of the blue one fine day uh, that you know Uh, my colleague and a few of his friends are moving back from here from bcg to india to start a new business and they just want to meet you to sort of explore some ideas and sound yeah. sort of soundboard certain things that's how we got introduced to uh, varun and abhiraj and mm-hmm. raghav so we have a, so then he introduced me obviously i knew him very well so we met met the urban company urban clap in those days uh, team again the team was exceptionally smart and when we met them they had not even they had not even decided the idea of what they want to do they had decided they want to be entrepreneurs they had left their jobs and come back to yeah. india and they were exploring options so when we met them we we heard two ideas that we are thinking of doing either a or b and i think a was i'm i'm happy that they didn't go <laughs> go down that path so our our recommendation at least in that meeting also was very clear which obviously it's their company so they have to choose but we felt that just b seems which which eventually became urban clap and then now urban company is what they should pursue which is coincidentally what they ended up pursuing but again in the meeting where we were really really impressed with these three founders exceptionally smart very clear thought process very committed to being entrepreneurs to the point that they were willing to take the risk even when they had not decided and yeah. shortlisted the idea so to eventually we ended up investing in urban company and till date they are they are some of the smartest smartest entrepreneurs we know of and all of these three stories right mm. you mentioned after the first meeting you said and kunal said unanimously that these guys will do something yeah what what was that <laughs> <laughs> so very interesting yeah. right so we we've, we've tried to distill over the years try to distill what we look for uh, in a founding team or founders yeah. uh, over the years and i think while it is not complete in any way but we do have some semblance of a thesis sure. uh, in terms of what to look for number one is obviously this everyone will say but to us is extremely extremely important is Uh, exceptional quality of founders that's so important because especially at the stage at which at which we invest in the business sometimes you've seen even the business changes and how do you later. define exceptional by education? exceptional founders means extremely high conviction uh founders who you know shown a sort of some some spike in their lives in the past it doesn't need to be academic but you can tell that they have excelled at something in the past that usually is a sign that they have enough perseverance and grit to go through the grind and succeed at something yeah. in their entire journey till now right whether it's college education sport i mean whatever it be that's number one number two is uh, you know their ability to learn 
because that's what we've seen becomes extremely, extremely important. Many of the organizations which we invest in sometimes even change their business after we invested in the company. As a result, we value, you know, the ability to learn and become smarter as a lot more than a lot more important than raw skill. Because raw skill you can have, you can learn, etc. But this ability to learn and progress is a is a very rare but very important uh, important aspect, and that automatically means two things: that the founding team has to be rigorous enough to put in the work to learn uh, sort of to learn a certain skill, but at the same time and should have the confidence to obviously become entrepreneurs, which is what they've already done, but at the same time have the humility and the groundedness that when the facts, they start with a business idea, yeah. they put something out in the market, but when they go talk to 50 customers, if they hear completely different thing from customers, will they have the humility to be able to learn from that and evolve their business accordingly or mm. not? That becomes an equally important aspect of becoming a good entrepreneur, we feel. And then some cases the business hasn't even been set up, in which case this is all we have to assess. In which, in cases where the business has been set up, you know, we actually prefer business investing in businesses where the market may seem extremely small right now, but what they are doing is an absolute, you know, quote unquote 10x experience. That they, what they built is absolutely superlative, even though it's a very tiny market, very small, seemingly very niche. Yeah. But what they have built has absolute and immense love for, for the brand in itself. We've seen it is a lot easier to replicate that love over a period of time to a larger and larger TAM and keep expanding the TAM of your business while maintaining that sort of absolute love in place versus playing in a very large TAM with a product that people sort of love. You know what I mean? So I think it's much more important, even if the market seems smaller, but the product love has to be absolutely superlative. It doesn't really, it doesn't really cut it, even if the market is very large. And, and I believe, right, if, if I have to go back in IIT Delhi, hmm. 2007 uh, or six time frame, right, uh, that one or two, that two batches, right, 2006 yeah. and 2007, created companies in India worth more than $50 billion hmm. combined. Probably. And founders combined worth more than $10 billion, hmm. which is exceptional. Hmm. All these founders, you, Kunal, you know, Dipinder, hmm. Sachin, Bini, come from middle class background, yeah. right? And and shown example. What what was so special and why was that timing so important that you think, one, one is luck that it brought you hmm. together in those two batches. Yeah. Right. And other is what happened after that, uh, right? Timing wise. It's actually a very interesting question. I've never really thought about it that way. Uh, look, back in the day, if I go back in time, uh, entrepreneurship was honestly the absolute last option yeah. on people's mind. Most people. Even went, at ITD? Even at ITD. Very because few people. It, used was, it was a secure institution, right? You go out of ITD, you can land a job worth. You could, but. Look, the number of people who used to become entrepreneurs was still very, very small okay. as compared to today. Because there were no examples. There was no examples. People had never seen it happen. Yeah. Their parents had never seen it happen. Today, sometimes I'll come to that also. Yeah. Even parents have seen it yeah. happen, etc. So there was very relatively very limited yeah. precedent or role models yeah. per se. There were some companies, but relatively very few. And as a result, most people used to think that yeah, his job nahi lagi hogi, so he's yeah. starting a business. That's how people used to view entrepreneurship. The, the, the batch who used to be that then. Even, even till that time. I think it started changing yeah. over a period of time. Uh, but things have very materially improved now. Like I was talking to the first year batch of IIT Delhi students only one or two years back. I was giving a talk. And they were telling me something very interesting that in first year of college, they ran a poll of what students want to do when they graduate from IIT Delhi. Of all the career options, the number one was becoming an entrepreneur. I just couldn't have imagined that happening yeah. in the time we were graduating. So I think just 
it is fantastic to see how much india has progressed how much the psyche and the risk taking ability has progressed and as you rightly said you know this is iit delhi which is considered to be one of the top institutes yeah. in india and if people graduating from there don't feel secure enough to take their chances yeah. then i don't know who will, who will right it's very important to the country that they do uh, and uh, very important to our society that they do but that said i think over a, over the years entrepreneurship rightly so has become a lot more mainstream a lot more celebrated as compared to what it used to be the best example of this i remember very clearly when i was graduating i told my parents i want to you know yeah. i got this dollar salary which again no one had from our town had ever been to the us to work on a dollar salary and i tell my parents that i want to quit uh, and i want to start a business again really blessed to have such understanding parents who didn't really didn't really come in the way and they were more than happy to encourage me to do that uh, but the society around them and the the neighbors relatives etc they were just i mean they made life miserable for them aapka ladka kya kar raha hai he's gone mad he's gotten such a good education why is he wasting on starting a business yeah. uh, why is he leaving a us salary etc etc to the point where a few years back uh one of my relatives calls me out of the blue yeah and by that time we had become entrepreneurs we had invested in some company so in the extended family this was like the guy who understands yeah. entrepreneurship to some extent so we one fine day uh, get a call from one of my relatives and uh, very traditional family but he calls and says rohit yaar we are looking for a groom for our daughter <laughs> Do you know any good entrepreneur? <laughs> and this this is somewhere I believe near Bhatinda. Right? Uh, near Bhatinda, and I think to me that was a watershed moment. That's what told me entrepreneurship has arrived in the country. When a father is looking for a groom for the daughter and thinks that you know they want to look for an entrepreneur, that means this is the in a father's mind many times that is the place where they seek the most amount of security that my daughter should get married in the right place. if they are in small town india people are starting to think of entrepreneurs being a good option then that means as a society we've made a tremendous degree of progress coming coming back to right that uh, 2005 2006 yeah. and 2007 batches of iit delhi these batches set up the the infrastructure for e-commerce in india hmm. whether it be you know the flipkart and snap deal building up the the logistics hmm. uh, cash on delivery right warehousing model or be it zomato building the quick commerce absolutely uh, right why was that timing so special if you go back i i mean in some ways it also seems serendipitous in yeah. many ways that uh, i think india was uh, just starting to become an economy which mattered the consumer yeah. economy had started becoming slightly bigger uh, internet had arrived which again yeah. that was a big obviously a big big factor uh, for all of us we were all fortunately i would say graduating at the right time in some ways and i think some early examples of companies that got set up i uh, entrepreneurial companies that got set up and succeeded had started becoming visible like i think there was the example of make my trip which was also very popular was there nokri was there i think uh, so some info edge uh, make my trip etc some early examples had started to emerge so as a result i think it's it was a confluence of all these things that made entrepreneurship an acceptable career choice for some of us uh and i think that's where where things started in some ways post that as i mentioned the number of people taking that option has become many many more in a good way and i am pretty sure as time progresses uh we will look back and see that a lot many more even larger companies got created by people coming out of these colleges even after we graduated uh, i think one of the monumental moments in e-commerce mm. uh, was that uh, uh, cash on delivery became common yeah the logistics network became common mm. un, un 10 saalon mein hua kya 2011 se leke 2020 mein ki ye wala decade is almost sec- consumers don't think when they shop online correct so you know i, I remember Uh, back in 2010 2010 11 12 when e-commerce was just starting in india uh, i think the only e-commerce that really existed till then was 
flight tickets yeah and i feel you know e-commerce also follows a certain curve uh, which is kind of what followed you know what it followed in india yeah. that people understandably consumers want to buy the most uh, first it actually starts with digital goods which yeah. is what flight was a digital yeah. good and probably the most tangible and simple to understand good that it's a named flight from point a to point b at a certain point of time and e-commerce is making the discovery of fares easier yeah. uh, access to those flights better that is the easiest thing that people started with and then it follows a certain curve where the more tangible and known a thing is the easier it becomes to trust then i think the next thing that came online was uh, electronics and books because again you know the author you know the book kind of know the price if you go to a shop or if you don't have a shop you don't have yeah. access it is an easy decision to make because there is very limited subjectivity in gold similarly in electronics also you know the thing that kind of thing that you yeah. want to buy and the specifications the brands etc and it becomes a relatively easier switch so those are the things that started coming online first but people still for the longest time didn't used to believe that fashion can be bought, bought yeah. online because fashion is so subjective you know in a when you buy a, an apple iphone you know it is an apple iphone i mean you know what to expect but when you buy a t-shirt or a sari online you can look at the pictures but you don't know really what will come and whether the quality there are so many different aspects right quality fit uh, returnability etc and as a result there used to be a lot more inhibition in people's mind of trying something like this i think that's where a lot of the railroads that got built for e-commerce uh, in that decade come in very handy where things like cash on delivery which didn't used yeah. to exist before that they got introduced which made it easier for people to get confidence that okay i don't need i will be paying only when i receive something in my hands i don't have to pay right now and then trust the company enough to receive it at a later point in time easy return policies where again it is one thing to read that there is a return policy it is completely another to actually experience it that i ordered something i didn't like it or i didn't fit me or i didn't like the material and i was able to return it and my money did come back i think it was some of those really infrastructural things that got introduced and built for e-commerce which is what enabled e-commerce and then obviously uh, over the last 5 years there's been an absolute internet revolution in india that has happened before that mobile internet used to be still not as deeply penetrated in the last 5 years everyone has mobile internet this is something that we don't even ask a question whether will someone will have mobile internet or not which wasn't the case yeah. till 5 years back i think it's all these things that eventually led to a point where people now feel extremely comfortable with e-commerce uh which is also giving rise to a lot more newer types of businesses based on e-commerce whether it's consumer brands new age brands quick commerce etc and i'm sure we'll keep seeing more and more innovation happening as we go along yeah. and uh, i think one monumental shift that happened uh, in the journey of snapdeal was you and kunal going to china in 2000 that is true 12 right yeah. and and seeing millions of orders a day happening yeah, absolutely on chinese e-commerce uh, tell us about yeah. that so right? it was very what? interesting so we were in the coupons business so yeah. snapdeal started as a coupons website where uh, you know we would get coupons from restaurants yes. pass salons etc and put them online and yes. people would come and buy them the business was doing quite well and uh, you know but you know i think as entrepreneurs we always keep ex- you know keep aspiring into what more can we do and i think it's in in that period where we ended up in china because many people used to many investors used to tell us that chinese economy is doing very well internet in china is many many years yeah. ahead of india you should go and see yourself many they had not been themselves but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but fine day we said okay we'll yeah. we'll land up in china and see what what everyone talks about and what was very interesting in india e-commerce is still so new that maybe the largest businesses would be doing 10 15000 yeah. orders a day not more than that for sure and we land up in china and we visit one of the companies and i still remember we were standing in the warehouse of that business and they were doing Two and a half lakh orders that particular day when we were standing in the warehouse, and that just blew our mind away. That just 
like this is this is possible it's a matter of time it's going to happen because sitting in india you could just not imagine that to be a possibility and then we met a couple of investors there also who asked us okay e-commerce in china is doing exceptionally well what is the state of e-commerce in india and we told them you know that this this is the st- status this is the number of orders companies are doing he said why are you spending all your time building a coupon business go and build a e-commerce business if it doesn't exist and that's how <laughs> we thought that this sounds so obvious in hindsight uh, but at that part of time seemed so someone needed needed to tell us for us to realize in some ways that's how we came back we started the e-commerce part of our product e-commerce and then it did so well that we very quickly shut down the coupons business to focus exclusively on e-commerce dive down into a 2 by 3 matrix that i have prepared right mm. and you can answer part by part in sure. in this matrix right solving hard problem versus solving easy problem solving large problem versus solving small problems mm. and solving crowded space versus solving for new spaces mm. so let's start with solving hard problem versus solving easy problem mm. how do you look at it look i think understandably solving hard problems is much harder but i do feel in the journey of businesses that is what many times builds enduring value in the business because look if it's very easy then it's very easy for everyone else to solve and as a result as a business one can get off the ground very quickly but very quickly also realize that there are a thousand other people doing the same thing and as a result building competitive differentiation still requires you to solve a hard problem at some point you may postpone it to a later point by solving an easy one but eventually to become a large and successful business i do feel you will need to solve a hard problem at some point of time if the business was very easy to start then a thousand companies will start then you will have to solve the hard problem of building differentiation in a market where there are a thousand mm-hmm. companies if the business is very hard to start in itself then by definition very few companies will be able to solve it and you will have differentiation from very early on so eventually as a business i feel you have to solve some hard problem you may not begin with it but to become successful somewhere in your journey you will have to solve and solving hard problem for the sake of it it's required or how, because then people will will try to attach to that also no i don't think it's required to be for the sake of the hard problem i feel it's required i mean look at the end of the day the only thing that matters eventually is for any business who's your customer what do they want from you and can you do give it to them better and most more cost efficiently than anyone else that is by definition the business so as entrepreneurs sometimes this happens to us which by the way happened to us first hand and as a result i speak from experience is that you can start solving the problem with yourself first and get too attached to the problem not to the solution that customers yeah. are looking for which may be completely different uh, and hence we actually very strongly encourage entrepreneurs to start talking to their customers as early as they can even before setting up the company in sometimes just to get a feel for what they should be doing and again why i said we learned it the hard way is when we started our business actually uh, we started didn't we didn't even start as a e-commerce company we started as a physical coupon booklet yeah. uh, back when me and kunal left our jobs you know and this physical coupon booklet uh, would have many many coupons buy one get one free 40 50% off at many of the top brands restaurants etc in the city so me and kunal we thought it's a great idea we were 23 yeah. year old so we thought this was the best idea that could happen we spent the next one year uh because it was just the two of us yeah. collecting all these coupons sitting outside restaurants to convince the restaurant managers to give us an offer or outside brands offices to convince the brand to give us an offer and over the next one year we built what we thought was a great product we had not spoken to a single customer but we th- thought we had built we had built a great product so much so to the point that Uh, we had raised a very small amount of funding we spent more than half of it in just printing booklets so that we don't run out of booklets to sell because 
we were so convinced that this is the greatest idea that the day we start selling there is going to be a queue outside our office of people who want to buy these booklets so we printed 50000 copies of a booklet which had a shelf life of 6 months okay. because all those coupons yeah. were expiring 6 months the day we launched in the next 6 weeks we sold 10 copies or some single yeah. digit number like literally 10 yeah. 7 something like that and that's how we realized the hard way how important it is to talk to your customer before you build something we had not spoken to a single customer and because it was so hard to do somehow we had convinced ourselves uh, that this is a great product but when we put it in front of consumers they didn't see it the same way as we saw and they had a completely different point of view they didn't like the product at all uh, and all this one year that we spent in building the product and the amount of money we yeah. spent in printing those booklets could have easily gotten saved had we sort of done the smart thing of going and talking to our customers and seeing how they react to it but but you saw it as a hard problem we saw it as a hard problem uh, but uh, which is why i'm i'm glad that you asked the question that just solving the hard problem is not enough uh, a solving a problem which is relevant for consumers is extremely important eventually i feel as a successful business at some point the problem will become hard also because if it's too easy then everyone else will solve it too Either but just solving a hard problem in itself doesn't is not a necessity condition for a success yeah, absolutely and what about solving for large problem versus solving for small problem see there i have a different view eventually obviously for a business to become large your market has to be very large but we are strongly of the view that it is extremely important that whatever you provide to your customers has to be absolutely superlative even if that is the case for a small audience yeah. so actually as a result our point of view even when we invest in companies and look at companies is almost contrarian in nature that we look for a very small tam but a product which is absolutely superlative that at least within that small tam whatever you built has the ability to dominate the market yeah. even if it's as small a tam as uh, toxin free mosquito repellents for kids you want kids <laughs> which is exactly yeah. what mama art was yeah. when we invested in the company yeah. that was just one product there was there was this only one product which is doing really well okay but because they were so superlative i feel it was relatively more doable to expand the scope of sort yeah. of that brand love to other products and categories than that one launches versus trying to go after a market which is extremely large in nature but your solution is not good enough or just marginally better than the rest then i feel even the large market will always make it a struggle for you to gain market share it will always seem like a mirage that we are playing in a very large market but that mirage will never come true because gaining market share or gaining customer love is so hard because your product is only marginally better at best so at least we have a sort of very clearly defined view that it doesn't matter what the tam is and effectively in fact it's better if it's smaller but on the axis of superlativeness of the product that has to be absolute 10x and and what about solving for crowded spaces versus solving for spaces which are not discovered yet look there also i feel it is better to solve for relatively undiscovered spaces uh it seems non obvious at that point can you give two three examples of companies that you invested in mama earth in itself you know i remember when we invested in mama earth this is not that many years back 8 years 7 8 years back but the company was selling you know mosquito uh, repellent for mosquito repellent to- toxin free mosquito repellents for kids more importantly at that time the phrase d2c didn't even exist it came up after that and when we invested in the company uh, after that many of the investor friends who we know they also called us and said look guys we are supposed to be investing in tech businesses what are you guys doing investing in a sabun tel like mm. quote and quote sabun tel ka business yeah well, how is that a investor friendly business yeah we had a very different point of view that look kids is a large market these guys have a fantastic product 
people need alternates and if they do a good job they will be able to expand the market honestly they did far better than we we would have expected yeah. them to do all the credit to varun gazel and their team for having pulled it off i don't think we could have imagined them doing so exceptionally well as they have done but at least it was visible to us but then it was a contrarian bet at that point of time because very few new companies used to start in this industry uh, people used to only go with the existing traditional brands mm. uh, and that way it was a contrarian bet now after that seeing the success of some of the early companies in that space the space has become crowded yeah. now would i recommend to anyone to start a beauty and personal care business today only if they have a idea which is extremely differentiated because now it is much harder because the market is a lot more crowded the space is a lot more discovered which means on day one you have a lot more competition to deal with and as a result extremely strong differentiation from very early on is even more important today because you're playing in a crowded market and as a result although it seems uh harder but we actually feel it's easier to build a business in an undiscovered space because that allows the team the time bandwidth and just sort of free space required to keep building their business it will many investors will not be able to understand it for the first few years but i feel that's a smaller problem as compared to playing in a space which investors can understand but which is so crowded that building differentiation and standing out is hard yeah, which which leads to my you know next uh, thought that i want to mm-hmm. share that why are copycats so common in india mm-hmm. or maybe globally that if one company starts in food delivery space you will see 50 companies yeah. start in indian food delivery see i mean look that is that is just i feel human nature right in some ways all of us sometimes feel that if a business has done well then all similar businesses will do well and i think i feel do we, do we want shorter part to validation is that shorter part to validation also sometimes we just don't put in enough hard work to see and we just go instinctively that you know okay this business seems to be doing well let me start a business i remember very funnily an incident a very interesting anecdote that happened with me and this is again many years back when whatsapp was bought for 19 billion dollars by facebook and you know one of my relatives who was in the manufacturing business he used to manufacture carpets or like one of those things he calls me and says rohit yaar whatsapp 19 billion ki big gayi to main soch raha hu main bhi aise kuch shuru kar do messaging app bana do maine kaha uncle how is this a good idea <laughs> so everyone is already yeah. using whatsapp even if you wanted to do it we should have done it when no one else was there was this need but it had not been addressed yet after it has been addressed it's not such a great idea to start one more of such unless you have a, uh, a very interesting insight which is still relatively more undiscovered but instinctively we just i sometimes feel we don't do enough sort of hard work or research and just sort of go a little bit with the flow which is not always the best of best of ideas to start a new business which is why when we invest in companies we look and many times when we invest in companies those spaces they look very sort of uh, contrarian nature when you say it it will seem obvious yeah that there should be a demand for this but at the time when we invest there many of them seem very left field i remember we invested in beardo back in the day when people had just started this is even before mama earth when people had just started growing beards again similar thing that you know why is there a company needed for only beard products uh, who starts a new age company in the sort of sabun tel industry etc yeah. etc i mean just to us it made very logical sense that a lot more people seem to be growing beards there didn't seem to be any products in the market e-commerce had made distribution a little bit easier as compared to earlier and as a result a new good quality product as long as it's done well should have should have market acceptability but it didn't seem obvious back then and uh, you know you have been meeting various investors since you started right mm. back then 2007 then when you started right american vcs used to visit india then yeah. 2011 12 chinese vcs used to visit india and now it's a mix of american european and everybody mm. so so and how of indian investors yes yeah. so how would you if you have to give a anecdote to these investors who are coming out from outside india 
that how has india come a long way or how has india changed how will you feel no india has changed very dramatically i you know i think the sometimes when you live in a particular place it is not always as easy to perceive the change because it's happening very gradually but i think for me the most stark example of it comes when i go back to my hometown which i left for 20 plus years back and as a result my memories of that town are in some ways still in that capsule of what it used to be 20 years back and whenever i go back now it's almost a refresher of what it has become now as compared to when i was growing up it's changed in many many different ways right so few things few examples that come to mind one as i was mentioning earlier there used to be almost no focus on education from parents or many times from children as well i see a remarkable focus on education now because it is becoming increasingly socially accepted that good education can have can change orbits and have life changing experiences for families put together not just individuals so there's a lot more focus to focus on education which i see now uh you know back back in time when we were growing up this was again pre internet pre social media pre e-commerce etc our aspirations used to be really restricted because the whole world of what we knew when we were growing up was our small town and maybe a few towns nearby and we rarely used to get a glimpse into what is going on in bigger cities or people outside india etc i think i think that information asymmetry is gotten really really broken down through internet and social media and as a result aspirations have become a lot more democratized today uh, you know young people or uh, people in smaller towns aspire to buy similar clothes as people in big cities because they are consuming the same media it is accessible to them at the same time as it's accessible in big cities and as a result their aspirations are starting to become a lot more similar and homogeneous in nature as compared to what they were where there was a huge asymmetry between aspirations of small town indians versus large city indians so that's a big big change i remember a very funny incident i was telling you that uh, i used to play badminton when yeah. i was growing up i had never seen a yonex racket in my town i didn't even know they existed because and i didn't know because i only used to have a steel racket yeah i didn't even know rackets could be made out of graphite it is only after coming to delhi that i bought a first yonex racket for 800 rupees and you know we just if you think of the india today that is not the case a person sitting in the small town knows exactly which are the good racket what are they made of and how to buy the right racket and will have access to that racket using internet as well so that's very materially changed and the third again i'm just there are many but one one more uh, example that comes to mind is uh, uh, you know women entrepreneurship at like the real grassroots level in even small towns and cities is very visible again you know india for the longest period of time historically has been a society which has assumed that men will work and women will not work i think that is starting to change very clearly like when i go back to my hometown uh close enough to 100% of the businesses were run by men to i go today and in the street where i used to live there are three boutiques uh which are run by women started by women operated by women out of their houses yeah. or out of a sort of nearby store etc i mean that's that's remarkable change you know back then i sometimes joke that even women's tailors used to be all men <laughs> i think at least now now there are a lot more women entrepreneurship happening lot more women are working now lot more women are getting professionally educated which is a great trend to see i mean so i mean in the last two decades Uh, these are just small snippets of the ways in which india has changed but india is india is changing very very rapidly and uh, what are the future things that you never expected or people never expected mm. that a startups could be started or businesses could be started in these sectors also mm. so that's uh, that's another thing which is very interesting and that's maybe more specific and focused on the way startups have evolved you know again 10 15 years back in the early these were still early days of entrepreneur entrepreneurship in india it was not as mainstream still very few very few people used to become entrepreneurs 
I think startups used to be a sector back then in itself. And the scope of startups used to be very limited to technology, yeah. internet, some sort, some form of SaaS, etc., etc., and that's it. Cut to today, I feel there is a startup in every sector. It's no longer a sector in itself. It's there is a new age company in every sector, even sectors which we would consider as traditional as possible. Things like agriculture, healthcare, manufacturing. I mean, logistics, these are considered not even decades, centuries old industries. And I think today there are new age companies starting in all of these sectors because the underlying landscape has completely transformed in the last 10, 20 years with the advent of just things like internet, mobile internet in everyone's hands. The way a farmer is taking care of his crops today is very different from they were they, how they were taking care of 20 years back. The decision of what to grow is very differently made as compared to how it was made 20 years back. There's a lot more focus on health amongst Indians now as Indians are becoming more affluent. Some of the basic needs are getting met. Life expectancy is increasing. People want better healthcare solutions over a period of time. You know, the GDP of India is regularly growing. People's disposable incomes are growing. And as a result, I think that sort of in some ways happens in orbits as well. That every year, a very large number of families in India cross the orbit of having met their basic needs and have some money to spare. That, that small amount of money to spare, incremental small amount of money to spare creates new businesses. Because now, now that they have the money, they aspire for better things, better education for their kids. They want to look better, dress better, take care of themselves better, have access to better health care. Yeah. Each of these spaces are so large, which creates so many opportunities in small niches. And that's the beauty of India, that e each small niche is still millions of people. Yeah. Uh, and hence, very large businesses get, can get created in those. So I think that way we are seeing a lot more a lot more penetration of startups into very wide sort of variety of sectors, many times which were considered very, very traditional also happening now. And coming, to, you know, since we are talking about the, the new different kind of startups that are getting built, right? There's a requirement for investors and more as early as possible. Hmm. So can people do angel investing full time? And coming back to some of the anecdotes, right? Mm. If you can share, right? Your first angel investor, Ken Glass, right? Mm. What was the exit for him mm. at Snapdeal? And what are some of your own 100x exits? <laughs> no, we've been, we've been very fortunate. Uh, we've, we've been very fortunate as an investor. Uh, you know, we've had some companies, which, you know, is out there in the media, which have done done great, sort of great, as they say, 100x plus yeah. returns, whether it's an Ola or an urban company or a Credgenix, Off Business, Marmar, yeah. and hopefully, hopefully a few more, hopefully a few more in the pipeline. But I think it's great that, you know, many Indians are starting to invest in companies. Uh, I think it's a great thing to do. We also started because in some small shape or form, uh, we wanted to do whatever we could to catalyze entrepreneurship in the country because both myself and Kunal are really passionate about entrepreneurship. We feel everyone who wants to should give, the, give themselves their, that shot. And entrepreneurship is the thing that will sort of take our country forward yeah. uh, in terms of creating more opportunities, etc. And so many other things. So as a result, we just wanted to be participants in catalyzing it in any way we could, which is how we started investing in companies, which then much later got institutionalized into Titan Capital, where we now have a fairly sort of decently sized portfolio. We invest in over 10, 15 companies a year and sort of stay with them for, for a long period of time. And we invest in absolutely early stage, early stage businesses. Almost by definition, we are usually the first check yeah. uh, into a company. That's it. While it's great to be an angel investor uh, for people, I feel getting access to deals, If as long as you choose to stay an angel investor, see, it depends on how you're doing it. If you're doing it more systematically, 
uh, versus you just want to do it sort of really sporadically that if a deal comes i will in, or a company comes i will invest in that otherwise i will let it go i feel if you want to do it systematically then it is better for an angel investor to become attached with some other some other outfit or some fund etc so that they have continuous access to deals or else what can tend to happen is that because you know many times people are good in a certain industry then they become angel investors i feel for founders to proactively reach out to a certain angel investor can over a period of time start becoming very restricted to only people from that industry because if you are from that industry and you've made investments in some companies in that yeah. industry people will perceive you not as an institution but more as a individual who has expertise in a certain thing and as a result you may or may not get get to meet a wide spectrum of entrepreneurs from different sectors which is where which is and which is also one of the big reasons we chose to institutionalize titan capital where as a result it's not only a particular domain we are actually meeting companies across multiple domains and that is what gives us access to sort of different types of companies from different sectors etc etc and sort of broadens the scope and also invest Uh, both in terms of time resources and just sort of the absolute amount of capital slightly more meaningful amounts of money that it's productive for founders and uh, today titan would be the most successful pre seed if i have to term fund in india so if you have to attribute the success of titan what would you attribute it to what are the practices that you and kunal and the the team followed a few things that we do is we are very clear on who we are and who we are not yeah and uh, which means like which means that we are very clear that we are seed investors yeah as a result we don't go looking at companies which are raising a series b yeah. series e series f etc that's not our expertise we are not looking sure. at public companies there are so many things we can do because you know investor is a very loosely defined term you can be investing anywhere and trust me there are enough deals that come to us which are so much later stage but it's having the discipline to focus on what we what we know to be our sort of position so that we can then build expertise in that of how to evaluate early stage businesses uh you know what kind of due diligence to carry out how to evaluate an idea so that's one thing which works really well for us secondly you know we invest in companies where we see a huge tremendous amount of upside not because everyone else is investing in it again by the same definition i was saying about companies if 100 people have already identified it's a great opportunity and i'm being the 101st investor to sort of participate in a company in that sector that doesn't that insights potentially not very valuable unless i know something else which the other companies don't do and as a result we stay fairly try to stay as original in our thought process as possible and extremely have a strong aversion to fomo that okay we missed out on something now we need to need to invest in it so just we have and that by the way has taken time to build that skill but we have no fear of missing out at all if we like something we will invest if we don't like something we will not invest out of fear that's the other thing which we do and number 3 i think which is maybe to do with our selection methodology of companies we look for com- teams which are exceptionally smart and have a great learning ability and if they already have an idea or a product uh, us feeling that can they deliver a 10x experience to maybe even a very small market I think those are some of the tenets tenets that we follow as a as an investor. I'm sure there are many more things which we do. And because you can be, uh, uh, you are super disciplined, but you can be super undisciplined also because it's your own capital. You yeah. are not accountable. No, I think that's one of the common common uh, misconceptions. I would like to clarify that you know from the outside in, sometimes it can seem very easy to be an investor. Yeah. It is not. i feel to be really good at anything over a sustained period of time 
everything requires hard work nothing happens without hard work even even if you are an investor because to be a good investor you know for each of the companies that did really well there are many companies that don't end up doing well for every company that you invested in that didn't do well you probably have met a 100 more companies that you could have invested in for every company that you did invest in with irrespective of whether it worked or you didn't work as a good investor we consider it our responsibility to spend time and effort and energy and give all the resources that we can to those companies which means meeting them very frequently uh to make sure we listen to what they're doing sometimes we agree with that sometimes we don't disagree with that obviously it is the founder's decision what they want to do but sharing our point of view as a sounding board all of this requires countless hours what is visible again as like the iceberg right what is visible is the few exits that have happened but to be a good investor over a long period of time it is very important to put in the hard work and put in the work uh, to be able to realize the realize that no one i think it's only only outside in that one can seem only lucky ones but that can happen once i think over a, we are very clear that which is why we still even though i feel as an investor we've done well in sort of picking a great set of founders and companies to back we still work very very hard uh for ourselves for the new investments we make as well as for the companies that we have invested in because just we are very cognizant of the fact and very also paranoid of the fact that uh, our success and relevance is 100% dependent on the investments we make today not on what has already happened because what has happened in the past is done we can't i mean we we have no part to play in that anymore so thank you so much rohit it's been such a phenomenal conversation i learned a lot uh, thank thank you so much thank you for thank having me it was really a really a pleasure for me to be to be on this thank you so much